anyone who has you know, spent some time browsing the internet or um, doing some business with an online company or something like that will be familiar with uh, a FAQ page. Uh, as I'm sure most of you will know, FAQ is the acronym for Frequently Asked Questions. And many websites have um, a page devoted to answering their, you know, the, the, their visitors' most common questions about their website, about their business, or some other relevant information. A FAQ page is simply a way of avoiding the, the endless individual emails to questions that just get asked over and over again. And if God were to have um, his own web page, he would likely have a FAQ um, page. Because over the years I have found that there are many frequently asked questions directed at God. I'm sure many of you here have had questions that you've asked God, and those questions have probably been asked by many other people as well. I am believing and, and hoping that God is going to bring our church into a season of harvest, um, and that we will be attracting new Christians into our fellowship. Now, last week, I talked to you about that. Some of you felt challenged about that, apparently. Um, but, you know, I do believe that that's what God wants us to do. He wants us, as a group, to really start participating in reaching our community because our community needs God. Can you agree with that? It does. And I'm not sure how we're going to achieve that, but I believe that it's something that God wants us to do, and if God wants us to do it, and we have the courage to step out doing it, then He will open the doors of opportunity for us to reach the community. And like I said last week, I don't think that, you know, we're going to do that by necessarily knocking on people's door or standing on the corner, um, you know, yelling at people, going down to the beach, pointing out all their faults and telling them they need that they need Jesus. I believe we're going to be doing that by having and building relationships with people, by interacting with them. And I believe the result of that is that we will have new Christians coming to our church. And you know, with new Christians comes lots of questions. Frequently asked questions that we need to have our own answers for so that we can help new Christians on their journey of growing in God. And so today we're going to start a short series that will deal with some of these frequently asked questions that people tend to throw God's way. Now these are the questions that come up over and over again, both from non-believers uh, as well as from Christians as, you know, at their various stages of um, spiritual growth. And while I'm not big-headed enough to think that I'm going to be able to address all of the possible questions, I will try and deal with the obvious ones uh, or any other ones that the Holy Spirit may lead me to deal with in these coming weeks. Now, don't hold me to this list, but it may, uh, because it may change, but so far I'm kind of thinking we're going to deal with questions like, um, you know, um, God, do you really love me? I know that's a question I've asked myself. God, why don't you answer all of my prayers? Jesus, are you really the only way? Jesus, why did you have to die on the cross? God, why did you create me? God, what's your will for my life? What will happen when I die? What will heaven be like? And of course, there may be other questions that come up as we go along, but these are all questions that I've been asked over the years quite often, and some of them I've asked God myself. Today we can start with one of the questions that most people looking for God will ask Him at some stage or other, and that is, are you really for real God? And I don't think that God minds that question as long as you are sincerely seeking an answer. You see, God has never required blind faith from anyone. From day one, He has always provided enough evidence of Himself to give us the faith that we need at the time to turn to Him or to trust Him in some uh, thing that's going on in our life. I hope you remember our lessons from the Exodus story 
and how God went to extremes to give the Israelites real reasons for them to have faith in him. He did incredible things. And so my point is that God does not require blind faith from us. Now, I don't know where everyone here today is at by looking around. I, some of faces I don't recognize. Uh, but, you know, most of you um, may well be Christians already. But it's always possible that someone might come through our doors that are just seeking spiritual truth or perhaps even an atheist or an agnostic person wondering if there is more to the meaning of life. I remember a few years ago, we had a lady come, uh, come up one Sunday morning. She was in great pain and could hardly walk at the time. Pastor Dennis came up to me, come and pray for this lady. And so uh, I went up to her, but before I even prayed for her, she, she warned me that she was uh, an atheist. And I said, well, that's okay. God loves atheists as well. And after I prayed for her, her pain immediately and completely disappeared and she was then challenged with something that didn't fit in with her atheistic beliefs. How could this happen to her, she wondered. And in that moment, she was confronted with the truth that there was indeed a loving God who cared for her and he proved it by miraculously healing her and taking her pain away. And those of you who are here that day will remember her face when she turned around and was astounded that suddenly she could walk without any pain. In any case, for all of us, no matter you know, where we're at, I'm going to do my best to answer this question, God, are you really for real? In a way that I think perhaps God himself may have answered it. And the first thing that God would probably say is, I'm as real as everything that you see. You know, back in 2005, Newsweek and, and BeliefNet conducted a poll where the question was asked, do you believe that God created the universe? And here were the results. 80% said that they believed that, they believed that God created the universe. 10% didn't believe that God created the universe. 1% uh, didn't believe in God. I was surprised by how low that number was. And 9% just didn't know. Isn't it amazing that even though most of Western institutions of higher education have done their absolute best to take God out of the picture, to convince their students that there is no God, and they've been doing this over the last few decades, nonetheless, 80% of Western people still think that God created the universe. Clearly, despite you know, all the covert brainwashing that we've been subjected to, there is something resident within each of us that draws us to look at creation around us and then come to the conclusion that there must be a creator. And the truth is that you don't need to be a rocket, science, uh, a rocket scientist to come to that conclusion. You only need to not be brainwashed. When we look at a skyscraper, we have no doubt that a great deal went into the planning and designing of the building. And no one doubts um, that an architect and a builder and a great many tradespeople were responsible for creating the structure. When we look at the watch on our wrists, we know that there had to have been a designer and a watchmaker. When we see the giraffe, with perhaps some majestic mountains behind it, or the dolphin or whale swimming in a vastness of an ocean, you know, brimming with life and color, when we look at the incredible design of the human body, indeed of any creature's body, what conclusion should we come to? Clearly, the only reasonable conclusion is that there must be someone who has designed and created these wonderful things. Of course, the atheist scientists will tell you that it was a fluke of nature, but they can't give you any scientific evidence of this fluke ever actually happening. The best that they've ever come up with is the implausible theory of evolution. And the reason that it's only a theory is because as hard as they have tried, 
They simply can't scientifically prove it, and that's because it isn't a possible theory. And yet most kids come out of school brainwashed into believing evolution has been proven by science. You know, they show you a, 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 a thing like this, uh, and they make you believe that it's been proven scientifically when it's only a bogus theory. It truly is a bogus theory. No one who has ever truly searched for God has failed to find Him. The Bible promises that if we seek God with all of our heart, that we will find Him. And the Bible has never been wrong. It's only when people who refuse to accept God and who He is, that come up with excuses for not seeing Him or finding Him. Speaking of these people who refuse to accept God, the scriptures say this in Romans 1 verses 19 and 20. They know the truth about God because He has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see His invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. You know, something that's not widely known is that 40% of scientists today do not accept the theory of evolution. They don't necessarily accept that there is a God, but they do not accept the theory of evolution because they've been smart enough to realize it's such a bogus theory. Folks, if we truly have an open mind, the Bible says that we will know that there is a God simply by observing what He has created. The sheer complexity of our planet points to a deliberate designer who not only created the universe but sustains it today, as we are told in Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 17. Let's read that. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through Him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made things that we can see and the things that we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Yes, there is an unseen world around us. Everything was created through Him and for Him. He existed before anything else, and He holds all of creation together. Jesus made everything that we see, and He holds it all together in perfect place and harmony. There are many examples that any open-minded person could look at to see God's design in place. But let's just consider one very obvious one, perhaps the most obvious one, the planet that we live on. Some atheists call Christians fools for believing in a creator, but let's just consider who the fool really is. Let's think about this in an intelligent manner and consider the reasonable, viable chances of the earth and its perfectly designed shape and size appearing by accident from nothing at all, in comparison to it being created by a creative, all-powerful God. Let's look at those two options. The Earth's size and corresponding gravity holds a thin layer of mostly nitrogen and oxygen gases, only extending about 80 kilometers from the Earth's surface. If we drive you know, uh, straight up as far as from here to Brisbane, we would run out of atmosphere. And so nothing on Earth could survive only 80 kilometers away that way. 80 kilometers that way and no life can be sustained. If the Earth were any smaller, the atmosphere we do have would be impossible to sustain life, like in Mercury. If the Earth were any larger, its atmosphere would contain free hydrogen, like Jupiter. The Earth is the only known planet equipped with an atmosphere of the exact right mixture of gases to sustain plant, animal, and human life, as it does. 
out of the billions of planets out there in, the, in this enormous universe, only this one can do that. The atheists would call this an incredible fluke, a one chance in a quadrillion, a miraculous fluke indeed. The problem is that to have a miracle, you need to have a God. The earth is also located the exact right distance from the sun. If the earth was any further away from the sun, we would all freeze. If it was any closer to the sun, we would burn up. Another incredible explosive fluke. The earth manages to remain its perfect distance from the sun while it rotates around the sun at a speed of, does anyone know how fast we're actually going right now? 108,000 kilometers an hour. That's the speed that this giant ball is now circling the sun at. As some of you may know, I, I have a motorbike, and I confess that there was at least once when I drove over the speed limit on a, you know, no traffic road, of course. My bike is one of those sport bikes it's not one of those sport bikes that you know you lie down over the over the uh, handlebars over the 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 tank you know to avoid the blast of wind it's not one of those most harleys you sit upright and at, at any serious speed you start feeling like um, a parachute on the back of a drag car at speed uh, you got to grip on really tight uh, to the handlebars otherwise you feel like you're going to fall off the seat. But here you all are, right now, sitting in your plastic seats with no seat belts, <laughs> going around the sun at 108,000 kilometers an hour, and your hair is not even flickering. <laughs> Must be awesome hairspray. <laughs> you see, even at these far out speeds, this massive ball that we live on takes exactly one year to go around the sun. And it has done it consistently and precisely year after year since it was created. What a fluke! Here's another fluke of nature. While this massive ball that we call Earth is flying around the sun at 108,000 kilometers per hour, it is also spinning. And at this high speed, it manages to keep rotating on its axis at a consistent rate. It does a full turn every 24 hours, allowing the entire surface of the earth to be properly warmed and cooled every single day. Again, the atheist will say, what an amazing fluke that started with just a big bang. Despite such incredible speed of 108,000 kilometers per hour, it keeps consistent to its full rotation every 24 hours. How many of you have tried to keep at the speed limit consistently? How many of you have managed to not go one kilometer less or one kilometer over the speed limit? Try as hard as you can. Some of you have less trouble than others, I know, but... And yet this earth manages to do that with precision. In fact, this planet is so consistent in its journey that we can mathematically pr predict the exact date, time, and place where it will be a thousand years into the future. What a miraculous fluke. Now, how on earth, really, can any reasonably intelligent person believe that all of this just happened and it keeps on happening by mistake, by some random explosive fluke? Seriously. How can a highly intelligent person actually believe this? How can something as intricate and perfect as the size of the earth and its atmosphere be explained outside of the fact that there is a God, that He is real, and that He is both the architect and the creator of this planet. How can anyone believe that this just happened 
by chance after some big explosion. The evidence is really quite obvious and overpowering if only the atheist would be willing to look at the overwhelming evidence. And so first God might say, if you want to know how real I am, then just open your eyes and look at the evidence. The second thing that he might say is, I'm as real as the Bible that you own. Even skeptics admit that there is something about the Bible that sets it apart from any other type of literature that's ever been discovered. And that is because rather than just words on a page, the text of the Bible has the ability to transform your life if you open yourself up to its truths and begin to live them out. Amen. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says this, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting deep between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. See, the, the, the most unique attribute of the Bible is that it is able to get totally personal with its reader. It can personally confront you like no other book can, and it has been doing this for thousands of years, no matter what year it's been read. Like with the Earth illustration, here too the evidence concerning the Bible is quite overwhelming. As we know, a person can be sentenced to life in prison or in some countries even to a death sentence on the testimony of one or two witnesses. Well, over the last 2,000 or so years, there have been literally countless witnesses, countless testimonies that agree that they have been changed by the Word of God. I am still being changed by the Word of God. It hasn't stopped doing that to me. The Bible is not some dry, dusty volume of irrelevant facts, but rather a living, breathing document meant to radically change your life for the better. The reality of God's power and presence is found in the very words that He has written. God already knows you, but if you want to know God, then you're going to need to read these words because they are His self-revelation, if you like. God has not only revealed Himself and what can be observed in creation, but He has even more specifically shown Himself in the Bible. God's thoughts, personality, and attitudes can only be known if God chooses to reveal them, and He has in our Bibles. If He hadn't, we would be at a loss to understand how He thinks or, or even uh, uh, know what pleases Him and what disappoints Him. You see, God wants us to know Him, and He has told us in the Bible everything that we need to know about His character and how to relate to Him properly as both a holy God and a loving Father. Not having this accurate knowledge about God explains the confusion that all the other false religions have. While the stubborn God-rejector will disregard the Bible's credibility and accuracy, the truth is that to this day, archaeological findings are confirming and continue to confirm the accuracy of the Bible. Just recently, for example, an archaeological find in northern Israel in, in August 1993 confirmed the existence of King David, author of many of the Psalms in the Bible. The Dead Sea Scrolls, and other archaeological discoveries continue to substantiate the historical accuracy of the Bible. It's amazing. You know, you can go to the library and pick up some history book and you'll read it and believe it. Written by one author sometimes. And you'll read it. If you're reading about, you know, Bob Hawke or Abraham Lincoln or whatever, you'll read their biographies or you read some kind of history book and you believe it. But some people have problem reading and believing that the Bible is accurate? Let me tell you about the Bible. The Bible was written over a 1500 year span by 40 different authors in different locations and on even different continents. Written in three different languages covering diverse subject matter at different points in history. And yet, despite all of that diversity, there is an astounding consistency in its primary message, which is 
that God created the world that we live in and he, cre he created us specifically to have a relationship with him that he deeply loves us that we have sinned and are under God's judgment and in need of his forgiveness because of his love for us God has provided a way for our sins to be forgiven he asks us to receive his forgiveness and and have a revelation with him that will uh, sorry have a relationship with him that will last forever I mean this is the common theme through the whole Bible there's no contradictions in there along with this central theme the Bible specifically reveals God's character and it lets us know that he loves us and he wants us to be in an eternal relationship with him if you want to understand appreciate and relate to the reality of God then begin to explore his book and you'll end up with no doubt that God is real however the key to being impacted by the Bible is a genuine desire for the truth one thing that God will never do is ram the truth down your throat did you ever notice Jesus never did that when he was teaching people he would just tell the truth if you didn't want to accept it he didn't try to force you to accept it he let you go God will never force the truth but if you have a genuine desire for the truth you will find it and then if you have that genuine desire you will both find God and you'll end up finding yourself who you really are but be prepared to be challenged and changed because if you read it with an open heart you will be impacted and changed by the Word of God second Timothy 3 16 says this all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives it corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right now if you don't want to find God and, and you don't want to know what is wrong with your life and you don't want to be corrected when you are wrong and you don't want to know what is right for your life then I warn you not to read the Bible because that's what it will do in answering this first fact this first frequently asked question after saying I am as real as everything that you see and as real as my word is God may then say I'm as real as the son I sent to sacrifice for you Bono the lead singer of the rock group U2 has become quite an influential person over the last number of years I have to give Bono credit for being a doer and not just a talker I mean he certainly gets things done about the things that he's passionate about now I don't know Bono well enough to know if he's a dedicated Christian as as we would know um, uh, a believer to be but he certainly is a believer and while I don't agree with everything that Bono says I do agree with what he said when he was asked one day the question if the claim of Jesus divinity was far-fetched let me read you his answer to that question no it's not far-fetched to me look the secular response to the Christ story always goes like this he was a great prophet obviously a very interesting guy had a lot to say along the lines of other great prophets be they Elijah or Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius but actually Christ doesn't allow that he doesn't allow you that he doesn't let you off that hook Christ says no I'm not saying I'm a teacher don't call me a teacher I'm not saying I'm a prophet I'm saying I'm the Messiah I'm saying I am God incarnate and people say no no please just be a prophet a prophet we can take but don't mention the M word because you know we're gonna have to crucify you and he goes no no I know you're expecting me to come back with an army and set you free from these creeps but actually I am the Messiah so what you're left with is either Christ was who he said he was the Messiah or a complete nutcase I mean we're talking nutcase on the level of Charles Manson this man was strapping himself to a bomb and had the king of Jews on his head and as they were putting him up on the cross 
was going, okay, martyrdom, here we go, bring on the pain. The idea that the entire course of civilization over half of the globe could have its faith changed and turned upside down by a nutcase, for me, that is far-fetched. I think that for someone like Bono, this was a very insightful answer. And I agree with his thoughts because he put forward a reasonable argument. But the truth is that most of modern civilization accepts that Jesus was a real historical figure. While obviously not everyone accepts him as God, only the most ignorant and simple-minded among us would actually deny his existence. Jesus is for real. Always has been for real. He really was born of a virgin. He really lived a sinless life. He really showed compassion for people. He really died on a cross as our substitute, as payment for our sins. He really rose from the dead. And he really has fulfilled his promise to save all of those who come to him and commit to follow him. And when, we, when he talked about his father, his heavenly father in heaven, when he talked about him, he wasn't quoting someone else. He was speaking from the experience of a very close union, unique to all of mankind. In John 14, verse 9, Jesus said, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. This was the kind of statement that would have um, infuriated the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders of his day. But he also made many other statements that could only be understood as a claim to be God the Son equal with his God the Father. Let's read one example from John 8, verses 12 to 19. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. The Pharisees replied, You are making those claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. Jesus told them, These claims are valid even though I make them about myself. For I know where I came from and where I'm going but you don't know this about me. You judge me by human standards, but I do not judge anyone. And if I did, my judgment would be correct in every respect because I am not alone. The Father who sent me is with me. Your own law says that if two people agree about something, their witness is accepted as fact. I am one witness and my Father who sent me is the other. Where is your Father, they ask? Jesus answered, since you don't know who I am, you don't know who my father is. If you knew me, you would also know my father. Jesus claimed for himself attributes belonging only to God, such as being able to forgive people of their sins, to give people an abundant life here on earth, and to give them an eternal life in heaven. Let's read on in John as Jesus addresses some of the people who were refusing to believe in him. John 8, verse 21 to 25. Later, Jesus said to them, I am going away. You will search for me, but you will die in your sin. You cannot come where I'm going. The people asked, is he planning to commit suicide? What does he mean, you cannot come where I'm going? Jesus continued, you are from below. I am from above. You belong to this world. I do not. And that's why I said to you, that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. Who are you, they demanded. Jesus replied, I am the one I've always claimed to be. These were incredible statements to make with the assuredness and the authority that he made them. And let's not forget the most politically incorrect statement that anyone could ever say then as much as today from John 14 verse 6 Jesus told him I am the way the truth and the life no one can come to the Father except through me the day will come when we won't be allowed to quote that verse now of course he could make these statements with authority because 
He was and is the Son of God. He is God the Son. He had no doubts or reservations about who he was when he walked the earth as a man. He said he could make these statements because he spoke the same words, took the same actions, thought the same thoughts as God the Father did and does. These claims could have been seen as outrageous delusions except for the issue of the resurrection. His claim that he would die and be raised again to life on the third day would have sounded even crazier than some of the other things that he said, except that it happened. And this evidence of his resurrection was seen by way more than just two witnesses that are required by Jewish law to make it a fact. There were heaps of witnesses who were still alive to tell the tale when the New Testament was actually being written. St. Paul himself testified to this, even though he had originally been bent on destroying the remaining followers of Jesus. He said this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 to 9. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scriptures said. He was buried, and He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scriptures said. He was seen by Peter, and then by the twelve. After that, He was seen by more than 500 of His followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then He was seen by James, and later by all of the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw Him. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. The resurrection, like nothing else, is the ultimate proof that gave Jesus the credibility that he was who he said he was. It was because people saw him alive after he'd been resurrected that they were willing to die rather than deny him. Many of his disciples were put to death because they refused to deny that they had seen the living Jesus after his resurrection. God the Father, whom we have never seen, is just as real as God the Son, whom many have seen, both before his death and after his resurrection. And he wants you to know that he did it for you and that he loves you now and he, and he wants you to spend the eternity with him right from the beginning when he created Adam and Eve, God has always wanted to have close relationship with us. And of course, what Adam and Eve did, you know, put in motion a whole series of events that led to the death of Jesus Christ because that was the only way that God could restore that relationship between us and him. The compassion of Christ that motivated him to go to the cross for us is the same compassion shown by the Father who sent the Son to us in the first place. This loving God isn't just willing to answer your frequently asked questions. He is also the God who wants to embrace you right now, even before you've thought of all of the questions you might have for him. As we consider some of the questions people have of God over the next few weeks, I believe that we will find that there is no question that's too difficult for God. Amen. And while we certainly won't be able to answer all of the possible questions, I think God's Word will help us to answer most of them to our satisfaction. Can I have the team back up, please? So can I please encourage you to not miss these coming weeks and in particular invite someone like a friend or a neighbor to come along with you. It will be a perfect series for anyone that you've been trying to reach for God. Just tell them, hey, you know, my pastor is starting a series on frequently asked questions that people have about God. Uh, I think you'll find it interesting. Can, can I pick you up next Sunday? Try that. You'll be amazed at how many people say, oh, okay, I'll, I'll come. It could be a really good opportunity to get them in. Amen? Amen. 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 If, let, let me tell you, if they, if they do come, they'll end up eternally grateful to you for inviting them, just as I am grateful that Bernie invited me 
that first time I went to church and found Jesus. I'll always be grateful that she had the courage to invite me. Because you know, many Christians don't have the courage to invite people to go to church, but she did, and I went. And I admitted that my motives were not entirely pure. She was pretty hot, she's still hot. And I was gonna go, even if she asked me to go some crazy place. But God had another plan. And so if anyone's here today and you've never made that decision to start following Jesus, you, maybe you've been sitting on the fence for a while and maybe you're here just looking for answers, then you know, why don't you come as we sing this closing song and I'd love to pray with you. If you need healing, if you have pain in your body, whatever, God is in the healing business. He loves to heal people. And I love to see the smile he puts on people's face when he takes the pain away. And so if that's you, you come. I'll gladly pray for you.